I'm Dr. Kasperson. I am a board certified urologist. I work at Pacific Northwest Urology Specialists. The most common infection in the United States of America is a urinary tract infection. So everybody sees it and deals with it or has one um, in their lifetime. So I think I was talking to Sheila like a year ago and I'm like, I'm gonna give a recurring UTI talk because it's one, it's like one in eight diagnoses in primary care. Um, I see recurring UTIs all of the time in our training urologists are surgeons and so we got this much training on what to do with recurrent UTIs because they're us it's usually not surgical right so you kind of have to develop what you're going to do in your practice with recurrent UTIs because they will come to urologists and people come to the urologists and they say I would like to not ever have a UTI again so I've gotten to the point of saying well let's adjust expectations majority of them are, are women and the studies are over 50 percent in one lifetime um, eight to one ratio women to men, and kind of setting the expectations of, I can never promise you, you will never get a UTI again, unless you are dead. Because when you are dead, you can no longer have a UTI. <laughs> and I say a little bit nicer than that, but the gist of we are living, breathing human organisms, and other organisms are attracted to us. And therefore, infections do happen as long as we're living. I think what patients are looking for is, how can I never have one again? Can you give me that? And I say, I cannot give you that, but I can have a conversation of how you can improve it yourself. Because I think a lot of people just, if they can empower themselves, say, the choices I make or the things I do are going to decrease my risk, everybody's into that. Sheila made me give you three objectives, and I'm sure they were somewhere but uh, for CME, but my objectives are to empower you, because I think when I started out, you're like, oh, Susie's coming in for a recurrent UTI, and you're like, oh, because she's going to be like, make me never have a UTI again. And you're just going to kind of feel like you don't want to have that, that conversation with people. That, that's how I felt. I'm like, I can't make you never have a UTI again. So people, you know, oh, Susie's coming in again for another recurrent UTI, and she's got allergies to Bactrim and penicillin and Cipro and blah, blah, and your, your heart kind of sinks, right? And so and she's coming in, she's angry because she's got a UTI and it keeps happening and why, why, why? And so my goal is to empower you to now say, okay, I think I get this UTI thing enough that when Susie comes back into my clinic, I know what to ask Susie, I know how to optimize Susie, I know if I need to order some tests for Susie and to help her decrease UTI. So my goal is for you guys to not moan as much when Susie's on your schedule because I moaned for a long time until I figured it out. And now I don't mind. I'm like, oh, recurring UTI, here's my spiel. It's usually successful, and, and sometimes it's not. But when it's not successful and they get another UTI, it's not your fault. So it's not your fault. You are a good doctor. It is not your fault when other people get UTIs. So how do you diagnose a UTI? It is not an imaging diagnosis. You know, you see these CAT scans, and they're like, consistent with cystitis and pyelonephritis, and the patient's like, I feel fine. It's like. That is not how we define a UTI. It is not how it looks on a CAT scan. It is not how it looks on a renal ultrasound. So I want, I want a clean catch, and go and, go and try it women. Go and try to do a clean catch. It's freaking tricky. Because you're like, read the instructions are over there, right? And then you've got the cup, and the wipe's now over there. And you're like, and oh, it's mid, mid stride, and now you've got pee on your hand. Like, it is actually kind of tricky to do a clean catch. Let alone now I have an extra 75 pounds on my body, or I have macular degeneration, or now I have rheumatoid arthritis. All of these things make for a very crummy, clean UA. So take the dip with a grain of salt, knowing that, yes, we're trying to get urine straight from the bladder, but there are a lot of challenges. I don't think everybody has catheters in their clinic. If you do, and you have a recurrent UTI patient, it might be a nice time to say, hey, you actually need a calf specimen to know if this is a UTI or not. Because a lot of, again, that older population is not going to give you a clean catch. And if you kind of want to get sciencey, get get a catheterized specimen. Um, especially my elderly female population, a lot of them, I'm like, I know they are not giving me a clean catch. You get a catheterized specimen. Now, there are false positives. There are false negatives. Um, but. In 2018, National Guidelines and Infectious Disease Guidelines, it's not an asymptomatic diagnosis. So a uh, person goes in, they're doing their well adult exam, the clinic calls them two days later and they say, you have a UTI, here's some antibiotics. That's, no, there's now, now it, there's asymptomatic bacteria, 10% of all bladders, if we took all the bladders in this room and we put you on a Petri dish, 10% of you are gonna grow something out. So that, that old wives' tale now of urine is sterile no longer exists. 
there's a, a certain amount of us that just carry our, or, our normal flora. And the thing is, if you kill that normal flora that you might be finding, that's when the recurrent UTIs will come, because now you just killed all the healthy guys, and you've just opened up the field for new growth and, and uh, pathogenic bacteria. So I see a lot of recurrent UTIs, and the, you know, one of the first things I do is, what's your symptom with a UTI? What's your symptom? Well, the doctor just told me that I have UTIs. It's like, great, you don't have UTIs. That's wonderful. Just because you grow out something, don't take a drug for it. And then the physical exam. I don't, I, I don't think you need to look at genitals every time somebody comes in for a UTI. It's way overkill. But if you have a woman who's coming with recurrent UTI and nobody has looked at her vulva and her urethra and her vagina, you're not doing her a service. And, and my thought is, where else on the body, when a, when a person says it hurts, do we not look at it? Right? My shoulder hurts. Oh, that's great. Here's, here's, some, here's some antibiotics. Look at the owie. We do that for every other body part, and we're not doing it, especially in the postmenopausal women, where there's tons of vulvar pathology. Um, men do get UTIs, too. I have kind of gender bias on women because they're 80% of the recurrent UTI literature, but men that do get UTIs, too. Three things on the urinalysis, nitrites, leukocytesterase, and blood. Um, nitrates to nitrites, only bacteria make nitrites. We don't otherwise have nitrites, so it's the food that we eat gets converted in our bladder. You are not going to detect net positive nitrites if you're just super hydrating and peeing all the time because you got a UTI, right? So you might get a false negative in somebody that truly has bugs in there because they're just emptying their bladder a lot and super dilute because they're burning and just trying to get rid of it. You're, the nitrites are actually, they say like, the urine should be stored in the bladder for four hours before trusting the nitrate. And it's like, who, who has a UTI who just hasn't peed for four hours? Who's coming? Like, they're miserable, they're peeing, right? So nitrates, again, they're, it's not wonderful, but it is, it, when you have it, it's pretty specific because a bug made that happen. Hematuria, you can, one of the most common reasons for blood in the urine is a UTI, um, but it's just a color changing strip. If I can teach anything like other of urology today is I don't need to see people with trace on a UA. That's not blood in your urine. And don't tell people that they have blood in their urine because now they're obsessed of like blood in my urine when it's a trace dipstick. Trace dipsticks are pretty much negative if you then send them for microscopy. Uh, but somebody comes in, they've got moderate to large blood in their urine, they've got symptoms of UTI, that helps you say, yeah, it's probably a UTI. You've got some inflammation, that's dropping some blood down. Uh, leukocyte esterase, not specific at all, but that's just a white blood cell. So vaginitis, uh, atrophy, kidney stones, cancer, anything inflammatory response. So anything that makes a white cell will cause that. So again, more sensitive, less specific, because lots of things can, can call that. So if you have a totally negative one, about 20% of people can still culture a UTI and be symptomatic. So the, the dipstick is helpful, but just understand that it's not a perfect test. Um, acute UTI treatment, get the story, when, where, what are your symptoms, urine culture, um, infectious disease society, the now is nitrofurantoin for five days, Bactrim for three days. And then phospholmycin is kind of the old drug that's new again because of the resistance patterns. That's nice, it's just once a day dosing, it's in a little powder form. But depending upon insurance coverage, can be expensive or not expensive. Um, black box warning on the fluoroquinolones now, and they do not, for uncomplicated urinary tract infection, fluoroquinolones are no longer recommended. What do you do? This, uh, I'm, I'm gonna tell you what I do. What do you do? I've got a patient that comes in, she said, I have recurring UTIs, and by the way, doctor, I'm allergic to penicillin, the cephalosporin, the ciprofloxacin, Bactrim, and I had macrobit once, and I just really didn't like it, so don't give me that one. Like, these people exist, right? And you're like, you're like, ah, oh, what do I do? I gotta call infectious disease, and you know, erdipenem, and where do I get the IV, and then what if this happens again? Like, you don't wanna see these people, because it's stressful. Send them to allergy. Allergy, if there's any allergy people here, but the allergy people I've sent them to, they love it, because the allergists are like, let's figure out what you're not allergic to. And they love it, and they're like, nope, not that. Yeah, you just had some diarrhea with that. Not an allergy, you can use Cipro. They will, they will shorten your list for you. And you're like, yes. So you've got this person coming in, and you're just like, I don't want to deal with Mary. And then you send them to, al and they will talk to them, they'll be like, well, sensitivity is different than an allergy, and GI side effects are, they do all that. So like, 
use your team members, and allergists are awesome with this. They'll be like, I will figure out that penicillin was not a thing for you. So recurring UTI is three UTIs within a year or two within six months. Culture proven symptomatic. That by definition is a recurring UTI. So behavioral prevention strategies. Fluids, there's two randomized control trials now looking at fluids and recurring UTIs. So they took premenopausal women, randomized them to regular behavior or one and a half liters of fluid a day. Followed them for an entire year. And those women had at least three urinary tract infections a year. Control group that year got three urinary tract infections. They stayed the exact same. 1.5 liters a day decreased their UTI risk by more than half. So it was like 3.3 a year to 1.5, 1.7 a year. So just drinking alone and urinating and getting the bugs out of there decreases your UTI risk. So there's great randomized uh, trials for both kidney stones and recurrent UTI as far as just fluid production. Diet, constipation is the big one because any poop that's there longer is old poop, old poop is dirty poop, dirty poop has more bugs that are gonna walk up to the urethra. We lost you. Sorry, did you lose me at poop? <laughs> yeah, we'll you whatever you're going, wherever you go, the farthest away. Oh, we were talking about pooping. Yeah. People should poop. Um, and that's the part of the microbiome, too, is if your E. coli doesn't, if you and your E. coli, there, it's infecting you, let's change your E. coli. We're going to change your E. coli by getting it out of there more by drinking. But we're getting your E. coli out of there by pooping more. We're, getting, we're changing your E. coli and defending you against E. coli by giving you vaginal estrogen. And then there is something to it I think we don't know enough about fiber, about a healthy diet, and how it changes our GI flora for the better. And you know, this is all prelim stuff on let's study the gut microbes of the American diet with not the things that grow on the ground, and then the, the diet with the plant-based things that grow on the ground. And people have different microbiomes, and I think we're going to start seeing a lot as far as you know, obesity, weight loss, metabolism, infection risk. Um, so I think there's absolutely something to fiber. If only it's gonna make you poop more, it probably will change your E. coli for the better. There's uh, data saying blood glucose, diabetics, get it optimized, that'll, that'll help. Stop trying to fashion the vagina. It's because <laughs> that's the stop scrubbing waxing the vagina. If I go over here, then this is a paradox, Tony. The vulva, the labia, it's the National Guard, okay? And when you, when you mess with your National Guard, you're going to let in other things that you don't want to be into your, your house. So, I, on, in a, especially in a premenopausal woman, I'll see them, we, we do an exam, look at the vulva, look where it hurts, and if they're waxing a lot. And there's actually studies now that waxing and removing the hair, number one, increases your vaginal discharge. So if a woman's complaining of vaginal discharge because it's not being trapped in her natural hair, and number two, it's it's not uh, it's allowing bugs to go up the urethra a lot more because you're just you're you're interfering with your natural barrier. So I'm usually pretty you know I try to be funny because it's like how do I be the doctor that tells people don't spend your money how you want to spend it and look the way you want to look like go for it. So my mom owns two waxing studios. So I tell my patients I'm like you know what my mom owns two waxing studios. You do what you want, but if you want to not get recurrent UTIs, just consider maybe trimming instead of ripping. Just consider it. The micro trauma will be a lot less and, and it might be better. So I'm never kind of, you know, I kind of just educate on anatomy and let people make the decisions. But it's like, if you want to not get recurring UTIs, let's talk about optimization. Um, and then postmenopausal, you know, it's interesting because just the postmenopausal state, you actually do have hair loss down there and there is an increased risk of urinary tract infection. So you kind of as you get into that hypogonadal state, that natural hair protection goes away and that increases their risk. Avoiding prolonged courses of antibiotics, which is ironic because one of the gold standards for recurrent UTIs is a prolonged course of antibiotics. So, mm. but a lot of patients, if you say, what's your trigger? What's your trigger for UTI? They're like, oh, I had this dental procedure and they put me on this big course of antibiotics. Or oh, I had bronchitis, so I was on this, and then they start getting recurrent UTIs because they killed their microbiome and now they've just got this opportunity for all these pathogens to come in. Um, spermaticide is a known killer uh, of healthy bugs. So that just basically, again, wipes out your natural defenses. How acid your urine is makes you susceptible to UTIs. We want to alkalinize our urine. We can do that with you know, prescription potassium citrate. We can do it with vitamin C, or we can do it with, again, the healthy uh, diet alkalinizes your urine. Also super important in your kidney stone formers. So acid urine will give you more uric acid stones than kidney stones. So it's that healthy diet that alkalinizes the urine that uh, decreases both UTIs and kidney stones. So therapeutic interventions, what do you, now you've counseled them about all the things they can do, but they're like, oh, doctor, give me something. 
So gold standard is you can offer them suppressive therapy, six to 12 months, uh, low dose antibiotics. There's a couple of different choices that you can do. Most of my ladies don't want to be on it. And I talk to them about, listen, there are severe risks with antibiotics. I actually have a dot phrase dot ABX because I, I always want it documented that I've told somebody that their choice to take antibiotics might result in a side effect from an antibiotic. Um, so suppressive therapy, it does work, but as soon as you stop that, their risk is just the same as if they did it before. Yeah, it might be a nice break, but their, if their risk factors haven't changed, and now their six months are done and you don't want them to be on antibiotics forever, they're just back to baseline. You haven't improved their life trajectory on that. You just kind of gave them a break from it. And your risk is you put them on that low-dose sulfur, that low-dose macrobid. Next time they have a UTI, get a urine culture because they might now be resistant to that one. Uh, macrobid has the quickest kind of, I'm not gonna say it like the infectious disease if people want me to, but the quickest kind of return from resistance is macrobid. Um, Self-start therapy is good for a motivated patient, especially if they're like, I'm sick, I'm sick of coming in, you know, it's always a Saturday, can I just have a, you know, a couple of courses? I think if you've got good cultures to say, yes, this is usually E. coli and it's sensitive to Bactrim, here's th you know, three refills of Bactrim, especially if they're gonna travel, like, give them a break. They don't want to find antibiotics in Lithuania or wherever they're going. But I have the ladies, and they're like, I get a UTI on Saturdays. Only Saturdays is Saturdays. And you're like, bugs don't know it's Saturday. Like, what's with a Saturday, right? And so really working into what are you doing, what are you changing that's irritating your bladder on, on the weekend? Because the E. coli does not know that seven days have passed. Um, cranberry. Super mixed reviews on that. I have a handout for a brand name one that's done a lot of research. I, I think people like to think they're doing something, so I refer them to the brand name one that actually did studies. I think at the co-op, it's not, it's not FDA approved, it's not regulated. Are they taking a high enough dose of cranberry? I don't know, it's not regulated. So there's some studies that say it helps, there's some studies that say it doesn't. Um, vitamin C, again, alkalinizes the urine. Taking the vitamin C with methenamine, which is a prescription, uh, uh, makes the urine more favorable for methetamine. And how methetamine works is it turns into a formaldehyde component into the bladder. We don't think there's any long-term damage with that. It sounds kind of bleh. Um, but I've got ladies that are like, ever since I started the methetamine, I haven't had another recurrent UTI. So these are all options. If you're just like hitting a wall and, and they're like, what else, what else? You can just keep offering. Because I think everybody's different. Somebody's a vitamin C and a drinking more fluid. Somebody's a vaginal estrogen and low-dose suppressive therapy. Like, there's all these different possibilities. Um, how, how does acupuncture work to prevent UTIs? Does it increase immune uh, response? And so you just have a stronger immune system? We don't know, but it's out there. I, I don't recommend acupuncture because I don't know that much about it or who's the good UTI acupuncture person in town. <laughs> I don't know, um, but it's in the studies. Probiotics, again, they, uh, I think there is something to it, lactobacillus. Uh, there are vaginal probiotic formulations. I don't really push them, um, but they're out there. And then vaginal estrogen is huge. So a complicated UTI is anybody with an anatomic defect. Uh, they do consider males to be complicated in the UTI world. Why? Because they have a prostate or they're more rare. Um, men shouldn't get UTIs, but they're certainly allowed to get UTIs. Um, UTI symptoms, younger men think chlamydia and gonorrhea, check them for that. UTI symptoms in an elderly man, a 70 year old, think about prostate, urinary obstruction, urinary stasis, things that you want to see a urologist for. And then immunocompromised people, people who just had uh, urology surgery, any sort of kind of high risk where your urine's just not flowing as it is or your immune response isn't. Uh, fighting as strong as it should be, it's complicated. And then there's, you know, you can do longer courses of antibiotics for them. When do I do a cystoscopy? That's me looking really concerned. Um, so Dan Rezichek and I started a YouTube channel for our business about a year ago. So just because the cystoscopy is scary, but it, it's actually not that big of a deal. I do not do a cystoscopy for recurring UTIs, and most urologists don't because the yield is so incredibly low. Right? It's usually not something in your bladder that's causing a UTI. So I'll do it if you're, if you're peeing blood. I'll be like, eh, cancer risk, let's do it. History of a sling. Anybody who's had a sling and now has recurring UTIs, I'm gonna scope. I wanna make sure there's not mesh in there. I wanna make sure there's not scar tissue. So if you've had a sling, you get a scope if you have recurring UTIs. Fistula stories, uh, malignancy, and then the worried well, like, oh, my cousin had bladder cancer. 
it might be that. And I'll be like, you want it? Let's just make sure that it's not bladder cancer. It's easy to do a cystoscopy. But I think it's overkill and over proceduralizing to do a cystoscopy on people with recurrent UTIs. So I have a video on cystoscopy and it has 9,000 views. <laughs> and then you can click on it and you can see where people are viewing you from. And I've got like Turkey, people in Turkey, they're viewing me. But it's, it's a cool, and then there's lots of other urology stuff on here. So there's prostate biopsy, all that stuff. Um, I have one on vaginal estrogen, I have one on incontinence, I have one on recurrent UTIs. When is a UTI not a UTI? Here's another pearl. When a woman comes in and tells you she has a UTI, she might not have a UTI. So when they come in, because in, in the United States of America, anything between here and here, especially in a woman, that's a UTI, you guys. <laughs> there, it can be nothing else, and women know that everything between here and here is a UTI. So they come in and they're like, I have a UTI. And you're like, oh, how do you know you have a UTI? You know, and getting the symptoms. So that's one big pearl. It's just because a woman tells you her diagnosis, it might not be her diagnosis, just like any other you know, part of medicine. Asymptomatic bacteria, again, uh, especially in the elderly or in a nursing home, they have huge rates of asymptomatic bacteria. Treating that bug predisposes them to uh, antibiotic resistance in addition to now predisposes them to recurrent UTIs because you just killed that healthy guy that you found and now it's an open field for all the pathogenic people. Um, asymptomatic bacteria, pregnant people and people who are going to have urology surgery, those are the people you treat. Everybody else you get to leave alone. Especially your people who have catheters, suprapubic tubes, indolite catheters. If they're asymptomatic, do not treat it. I don't like how it looks, I don't care, you're not getting an antibiotic. I don't like how it smells. It's a waste product, is it supposed to smell good? Drink more water and vitamin C changes smell of urine. Those are no longer reasons to give people antibiotics. So I think the antibiotic overuse and this D diff. Mm -hmm. um, any thoughts or comments on uh, nursing home patients? We get a lot of faxes and more confused over the last three days. Uh, we dip their urine. What do you, what do, right. you do? Yeah, I think um, there, there's a huge... Or smelly urine. But again, confusion yeah. common with memory. Urine. Yeah, and I think, I think where that's going, which is good, is hydrate them, hydrate them, hydrate them. Fix that. I think all these people are super dehydrated because they come into the hospital, right? They get all these fluids, they take care of them, they give them an antibiotic, and they perk right back up. And it's like, is that actually an asymptomatic UTI that acts like confusion, which is what we were all taught, right? We were also taught that urine was sterile, right? So we were taught that, but now it's like, no, elder, elderly people get dehydrated. Dehydration causes, I think it's where it's going is to teach people to not jump on urine all the time. And Penn Barnes is infectious disease. And I'm like, Penn, I'm doing this talk on recurring UTIs. And she's like, tell them not to check urine cultures on old people. Like, she literally was that because they get consulted all the time in the hospital. This elderly person, oh, it was this UTI they didn't know that they had, and they're confused. And I think the differential for confusion is so much bigger than an asymptomatic urinary tract infection. But people just go there. People just go there. And you're dehydrated, so now your urine smells. Right? And so it's like a, a, a cart and a horse thing, and it's tricky. But I think with this antibiotic stewardship thing and you know, kind of unteaching what we've been taught, I'm not saying don't do it, but just do it wisely and thinking about other stuff. Postmenopausal pelvis, oh my gosh, the pathology is huge. It doesn't look good down there, people, but nobody looks, nobody looks. So I do uh, probably eight pelvic exams a day. On the young women, because pap smear uh, requirements are going up in age, right? And then older pap smear requirements are kind of going like less and less older. So I get all I get all day long is I've never had this done before, or I thought I, that I was done doing this 20 years ago, right? Nobody looks at the owie anymore, and the pathology down there, which we're calling UTI, and we're drugging with antibiotics, is huge. And if you can optimize that, women are going to feel so much better. Um, and then overactive bladder, interstitial cystitis, and chronic pelvic pain. So I keep getting recurring UTIs. What are your symptoms? I just have to pee all the time. You think you might have overactive bladder? Yeah, because the antibiotics, they just don't, they don't work. I just keep having to pee all the time. And so there's overactive bladder. There's all these other diagnoses that are here that aren't recurring UTIs. So here is a, a potpourri of vulvar, vulvas. I don't have a normal vulva in my, in my thing. Um, so the first one, this one, that they call it beautifully, totally atrophic, totally irritated, there's no estrogen, there's no rugae, we've probably got a fissure that hurts when it's pulled right here, so sex is not fun. Your, the urethra is right here, I, it's, a, it's spread a little bit, but what happens is 
the external labia kind of expands and puckers, and the urethra mucosa actually puckers out. And people, you'll see this if you, the more and more you look, you'll get some urethral prolapse. Well, now you've got your mucosa of your cheek sticking out into the world. That E. coli is going to love it. And you don't have any hair bearing there, and you don't have a closed vulva anymore. And bugs love it. So the, the health of the, the vulva changes after menopause, and UTI risks go way up. So instead of just saying, oh, this Nancy just keeps coming in for recurrent UTI, it's like, make Nancy feel better down here and get her tissues healthier, and those E. coli are going to not, not go into her bladder as much. This lady, so totally atrophic, all you basically see is your urethra. And right here, you're seeing totally red fissures. That's another thing on the history of recurring UTI. It only hurts when I'm peeing, and it, it's, it's been for months. And I keep taking antibiotics, and it helps for a little bit. But So it only hurts when she's peeing is because she's pouring acid on a wound. And she got vaginal estrogen, and all of her symptoms went away. So urine's an acid, and when you put it on skin that's ouchy, it hurts. And a woman comes in, she says, I have recurring UTIs because it burns. And it's like, you've got pathology down here. If we can fix it, you're not going to keep going in and getting these antibiotics. Um, this lady, so external labia, super red and irritated, just ouch, 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 ouch all the time. Easily could be confused with a recurrent UTI because it hurts down here. It hurts down here. And so she was a kind of a steroid cream, uh, estrogen cream to get that kind of beefy look down. So there's tongue, point being, this is not a UTI. There's, there's often, a, especially in the postmenopausal woman, there's a lot more to it. So how I do it, I have a little bit of time. History to me is everything. Is like, is it sudden onset, sudden frequency, you were feeling fine until your UTI, or is it, you know, six months of I pee a lot and it burns sometimes. Um, so I try to really figure, is this an acute UTI recurrent picture, or am I looking at overactive bladder, uh, atrophic vaginitis, chronic pelvic pain, uh, all of those things. Records, I always look for urine cultures, because to me, I'm like, dip, I don't, you know, I, I need urine cultures to technically call you a recurrent UTI by definition. Um, the exam, imaging, my go-to imaging is a renal bladder ultrasound. That's gonna show any obstruction, any kidney stones. They do mandatory post-void residuals when they do a renal bladder ultrasound, so you're gonna pick up any sort of asymptomatic retention on them. And I say, my job is to tell you, my job as a urologist is to tell you your anatomy is normal. Once your anatomy is normal, now we work on your environment and all the things that we can change to not get infections. Cystoscopy, like I said, pretty rare that I do it except for a handful of cases. A any woman who comes to me with recurrent UTIs gets vaginal estrogen. Um, the data is so strong that it does not increase your breast cancer risk. The data is so strong that it helps prevent recurrent UTIs. Um, and this is how I tell, I have a YouTube video on this. So I tell women, because it comes in an applicator, you're supposed to put one gram up. I have all these women coming in wearing pads just because of their freaking vaginal estrogen is falling out of them all day long. Like, ick, I would, who would want to have vaginal estrogen then? They're like, I'm wearing this pad just because of this vaginal estrogen. It's like they stop using it because of the way it's prescribed. So I say, small pea-sized amount on your finger, you spread your labia, you put it right where you pee in the inner parts of the labia, a little bit up the vagina if you want to, a couple times a week. And that tube, which is expensive if you don't have insurance that's going to give you a, a nice deal on that, will last you four to six months that way. So I'm like, you're saving money, you're not going to be dripping out cream all day long, and you put it where you need that lactobacillus to go. And you put it, and especially with sex and dyspareunia, pain on entry. Once, once the partner's inside, I'm fine. Pain on entry, that estrogen cream can help a lot with that complaint. Um, estro estradiol is now generic. Medicare is just starting to realize that. So that just went generic 2018, and Medicare is just starting. So I think we're going to see that price go down and that access pick up a lot faster. Um, but a tube of Premarin or Estrays will last you four to six months if you do it my way. I've had so many women come in and say, yeah, they gave me that, but it was ick or it was too expensive. And I you know, give them my spiel, and they get on it, and it, it does tend to work really, really well. We have a clinic policy on urinary tract infections. We don't diagnose over the phone. We don't give you antibiotics over the phone. We, we just uh, need a urine culture. Now, we're urologists, and there's only so many of us, and that's kind of our policy. But I think it, it helps a lot just to say, especially in our world, of, is it cancer? Is it overactive bladder injury? All of the things down here that we see, it's like, if you want to treat us with antibiotics, 
you're going to be symptomatic and you're going to have a positive urine culture. Um, infectious disease and allergy. I already talked about allergy for that big laundry list of uh, allergies that you just don't want to deal with. And then infectious disease, they are so on board and seeing eye to eye with you know, the asymptomatic bacteria, don't overuse. If you have a patient who's just like, no, it's an infection, because see there, it, send them there and the infectious disease will totally have your back and be like, yeah, don't treat unless you have, like, it's just another, every once in a while we have a patient where like, you don't believe us, fine, infectious disease, and they talk to them about it and they're like, yeah, infectious disease says don't treat it either, okay. So they're, they're kind of just there for backup support. Uh, and they're totally on board for, for less is more on antibiotics. So takeaways, you can live stress-free when Nancy's on your schedule for recurrent UTIs. Now you've got so much stuff to talk to her about and to help her out with. Ultimately, it's up to Nancy to get less UTIs. It's not up to you, so don't take it personally. Um, and then everything between here and here, especially in women, is not a UTI. That's all I have. <laughs> The funniest thing about it, which explains a lot of how I got to be how I did, she won't let me have any services for free. She's like, yeah, come on over, you get the friends and family discount. And I'm like, I am your freaking dog. Just because I get to read all the stories of doctors being sued for like tendonitis from Cipros. Tony's, Tony's trying really hard and I'm being supportive. <laughs> I appreciate everything you're saying is great. Oh, okay. Well, my slides aren't that interesting because it's usually the stool bacteria that that poisons the urine, right? So you right. probably just do another stool transplant. Gotcha. Yep.